And uh, what we're uh, planning to do will be to kind of go through um, these two slides from key question five, uh, drill down a little bit, and try and come up with some um, uh, perhaps plans uh, related to each of these items and to some degree some prioritization. So as we march through these, we'll do a little bit of straw polling here with the, uh, uh, the, the, the few, uh, the proud, the remainder. Um, to give you a sense of, of how much. Now, of course, the, ten, the temptation is, is to vote for everything. Um, so I'll uh, trust you to uh, kind of think about uh, what's um, most important. Uh, before we get involved in that exercise, though, Dan asked uh, that we, again, kind of talk about output from um, this particular meeting. I had mentioned uh, earlier that um, uh, Blackford and I will be taking the lead in uh, producing uh, a paper, not so much a proceedings of the meeting, but um, what we've typically done uh, with these meetings before is to, you know, set the problem, uh, and then uh, we actually have uh, some, I think, very interesting data uh, related to the survey around the desiderata that we can kind of present, uh, which I think would be of some interest to the uh, informatics field in the sense of, you know, where, where, where does a group of, of folks that are involved in this on a day-to-day -day basis really, uh, you know, believe this, uh, uh, the synergies are around those. But then talk about, um, you know, the process of the meeting and focus mostly on, on the output and, uh, and uh, the lessons learned and the next steps. So uh, that'll be something that we'll be producing uh, hopefully over the next um, a couple of months. I think uh, one of the things that we might um, uh, ask, we haven't worked out all the details yet, but we might ask our co-moderators to perhaps take ownership of specific um, sections related to their key question uh, and with, you know, and having that as part of a co-authorship uh, and then um, uh, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Sometimes the group writing exercises aren't as uh, um, uh, Good on, uh, when they, uh, you know, it's, as Yogi Berra said, th in theory, theory is better than practice, and practice it ain't. So we'll uh, see how that works. Um, I think the a lot of these meetings we've targeted genetics and medicine as the target journal, but in in my view, I think that we may want to actually um, uh, either uh, target um, uh, the informatics, uh, an informatics journal like Jamia. Alternatively, uh, um, although it would be more work, is that if we can, if we think that there's enough information to maybe deconstruct this into two papers, one that would be more informatics focused, one that would be more genomics focused, that we might look at, um, you know, companion papers. But uh, those are things that we'll kind of talk about uh, at the end and decide how we want to uh, uh, to do that. Blackford has had some initial uh, reach outs to the editor of Jamia to sort of assess their. Uh, interest in this. Uh, genetics and medicine has been generally interested in the output of, uh, of these meetings, so I think would, uh, would certainly be receptive uh, to that. Um, and then I think the uh, other thing that, we'll, uh, that we're looking to do as part of this is uh, I learned something from uh, uh, John Steiner, who's a health services researcher at uh, Kaiser Colorado. He's the ch current chair of the HMORN uh, governing board, and whenever we have uh, exercises like this, he likes to proceed them by saying, we doesn't live here. <laughs> and, and, and so what he means by that is that when we say, well, we're going to do this, um, uh, he'll say, uh, well, we doesn't live here. Who is actually going to do this? And so I think what we'd also like, and for those things that we think are, are prioritized and, and we want to move forward, we'll probably also look to say, are there people that would be willing to potentially uh, lead a group in, in doing that and be a little bit more intentional. Now, um, uh, you know, we may have some of them where um, uh, we're all busy, this is all volunteerism, and, and we may, uh, you know, not have anything, in which case we'll, uh, uh, we'll kind of hang back and, and reflect on those more within our genomic medicine working group about how we might be able to move those forward. But for some of them, I think they would lend themselves to, uh, to actually um, uh, having someone take some ownership, and so if there, if you feel so inclined, if the spirit moves you, then please let us know, and we will permanently attach your name to that item with high expectations of deliverables. Dan, probably not a good time to raise your hand, but but I, first of all, to <laughs> to endorse 
So some of these actually look like the, the natural output would be a kind of a white paper advisory uh, to NIH staff. This one really does, I, I think, sit in a space where there'd be a natural broad readership, particularly in, in informatics, if a manuscript was to focus on, well, what's the difference between genomic decision support and uh, decision support as we've known it for the last three decades, then um, what's the current state of the art and then where are the research frontiers? Uh, that could, depending upon how, it, how it's written, could go to a number of journals, but, but it's clearly going to find a home in, in, in an academic publication because of its natural, uh, the broad natural interest in those kinds of questions right now. I think the other opportunity, and, and unfortunately I think the timing may not have worked out exactly well, I don't know exactly this, but it seems to me that this would be a really uh, cool topic to propose for a panel at the AMIA Translational Bioinformatics mm -hmm. meeting. And I think the, the, the proposal date for that is, uh, uh, is passed. Now whether or not we might um, uh, go the route of, uh, 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 I think with our um, uh, EHR integration special issue in genetics and medicine, I think we actually um, uh, went a presidential pick route or a late breaking session. So if there are some opportunities, I think this we could probably put together a pretty cool panel uh, on this, and that would be something else that would uh, would be worth at least exploring to see if there would be interest, uh, perhaps sponsored by the AMIA uh, Genomics uh, Group. So the the joint summit deadline for 2015 is. Um, was. September 25th, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's what I, th I thought I remembered and I said, you know, it just it didn't quite work out, but we still may have some opportunities uh, uh, to potentially do that. And I think, well, um, Jesse uh, Tannenbaum, who wanted to be here but was actually in the UK, um, uh, is the chair of the um, Genomics Special Interest Group, and, and is she also not? Um, in incoming chair, that's right. Yes. Bob is the current chair. I always forget the timing on that. So we have the current chair, and then Jesse is incoming chair. And isn't Jesse also up for board? board? Yeah, okay. Yes. So so we are slowly infiltrating yeah. AMIA as well. And so I can, say with a, I can say with a high degree of confidence that the AMIA Genomics Working Group would be happy to sponsor that sort of submission. Okay, so I think we will, unless there's uh, strong objections, we'll officially add that course, to I'm our, sure. uh, um, uh, I'm sorry? And I, I might be able to help as uh, chair of the board. As chair of the board, yes, yes, that, that is tr true, yes. Uh, thank you for reminding me about that. I didn't vote for you. Um, okay. <laughs> that's, but that's because I wasn't an AMIA member at the time you were elected, so that's the only reason for that. So. Um, so I think we will add that as, a, as an action item that we will propose um, uh, a, a late-breaking uh, session related to the output of this. And um, anybody, Josh, um, we are also doing a, um, a, a a year in review on translational bioinformatics um, as kind of a late-breaking session um, that uh, uh, Neil Sarkar is organizing, and I'm going to talk at it. And so, um, it will, you know, I can just highlight this as part of that as well. Um, clearly, I think going for a separate thing is advisable too because I won't be able to talk for long on that, but certainly can highlight it. Great. So we'll, we'll do that as well. And I think, um, yeah, so we'll look for other opportunities that we can kind of hold this up, not only to the informatics crew, but um, I think that uh, uh, we probably are at a, um, there's certainly lower knowledge about the role of clinical decision support in the genetics uh, community, and so I think we'll, uh, we should also look for opportunities potentially to uh, present at some of those venues to begin to put these types of concepts in front of uh, uh, the uh, geneticists that are practicing uh, to begin to uh, uh, get them used to the idea that this is uh, something that we'll be doing. Um, there's very little content in the informatics realm at the present time at our professional society meeting, um, but I think that that will uh, ultimately change. And I think one of the real opportunities, uh, David Flannery and I had a chance to uh, chat a bit at the break, um, is around the, um, uh, the act sheets, because in addition to the 
newborn screening act sheets that I referenced. Um, in fact, they're developing uh, act sheets around uh, the ACMG incidental findings list. So I think there's some really uh, great opportunities to take those act sheets, which um, are uh, things that would be very amenable to representation uh, through InfoButton standard, uh, but also because they're being uh, built in with uh, uh, you know, clinical workflows that lend themselves to creations as L2 artifacts and then hence for coding. I think those are, again, low-hanging fruit that we could look for partnering. So we're sort of jumping into some of the, uh, uh, some of these aspects already, but um, I think these are all uh, good outputs from, uh, from the meeting that would be very easy to move forward. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and start to um, uh, dig into these. I may go a little bit out of order here because I, I think you know there there are some of them that may be um, uh, a little bit easier than others. And in fact, I think I'm going to start on the second slide here because uh, in particular that first bullet, uh, I think that there are several things that we can um, can move forward relatively uh, quickly. So uh, we've mentioned several times the opportunity that um, uh, Ankh uh, offered related to moving um, uh, some genomic CDS around uh, uh, some of perhaps our pharmacogenomic use cases uh, to see if we can actually uh, go to uh, representing these in, in a national uh, CDS repository using that immunization model. And, and Ken, thanks for uh, requesting some information that we can ultimately distribute to the group. Um, to, in my view, that would be something that um, is highly desirable, um, is something that I think we could potentially charge the eMERGE PGX uh, group to take ownership of to, you know, say, okay, uh, amongst us uh, where we're all implementing this, let's pick three to five that we can all agree on uh, that would be good and then uh, try and take the leadership of engagement. So we would have a who and we would have a what. Um, so that would be at least a, a proposal that I would make to the group uh, for purposes of, of discussion or violent objection. I think I might have mentioned this a little bit, but the VA actually has funded and is funding this work, and there is already an uh, initial sandbox available. And um, uh, so I think it could dovetail very nicely, and if, if you know Steve Brown from uh, Vanderbilt, um, he, he leads that group. and. I think even for future work, it's very possible you could just influence Steve to get genomics into the uh, contracting vehicles for the VA Knowledge Based Systems team. So you can even actually have this paid by a different agency and get this work done. Um, we've discussed in personalized medicine before, too. I'm sorry, what is the VA funding? The VA is funding um, some contracts around developing models, standards based decision support, and included in that is the development of open source. Sandbox environments that uh, work with Vista. So, uh, in general, but we have discussed funding things in genomics before, and um, I think there's potential interest where I think it could be very amenable to getting that in there. Yeah, and Larry Meyer has certainly been a friend of the uh, of this group and has participated in a number of prior meetings. Although, to my knowledge, I don't think, and, and Dan, maybe you can, you, you may know the answer to this, but I don't know that uh, the VA is moving forward at the present time with any pharmacogenomic implementations. We're actually in conversations with them about, about implementing a, a project in that space, and they, they don't see it as being clinically valid or ready. Um, so, so we're talking to their research people. Dan, you may have, have, other, have had other conversations. But how about in the HIV AIDS? A back of ear. I mean, that to me, that uh, there, there's no doubt about that one. There, there does not seem to be, does there? Um, mm -hmm. But as far as we can tell, that is not one that they are implementing. So I can go back and, and ask again, and maybe others know better than, than I. But okay, Josh. I was just going to mention uh, that we do have VA as a site uh, for Ignite, uh, and so we're moving forward quickly. That we just got uh, funded. Josh is the PI, and um, we have a, a really great investigator there, Michael Matheny, engaged in um, bringing pharmacogenomics at least to the Nashville VA. So it sounds to me. Oh, I'm sorry, Betsy. Um, Terry, I just wanted to say that the VA actually has provided some funding to NLM for expansion of terminology standards in areas that are directly related to them. And Steve Brown, who was mentioned here, is also the person around that. 
So, um, you know, I, I could easily set up something for us to talk about this. Yeah. I, know, I know it's hard to imagine, but it's possible two pieces of the VR are not talking to each other. Um, <laughs> this never happens at NIH. Her heresy, heresy. Yes, amazing. And just If I could just add, um, uh, just to note, the people building the sandbox, uh, Cognitive, is actually now uh, doing the bulk of the work around exactly this clinical distance board inf infrastructure for the Enterprise Health Management Platform, which is the next-gen VA system. I think it's like a $180 million project. So there's extreme synergy where, obviously, the pe people building the sandbox, actually building the same infrastructure for production use VAY for the next-gen system, could have real overlap where what you do in the sandbox obviously has a really good chance of making it into production if it's the same people working on it. Can you make, uh, can you make introductions, um, Ken, or send info? Yeah. yeah. So and it's, it's Emery is the main person, so you, you know yeah. Emery Fife. Yeah. Josh, Denny. Uh, with regard to the VA, Betsy, with regard to the VA uh, in, in LM connection there, is that around like Rx norm? Would that potentially uh, in, include pharmacogenetics in Rx norm? It, uh, it, it could potentially. Uh, the VA funding um, has been used to uh, move ahead the uh, prescribable names project where they're, you know, get something that's a little more user friendly in CPOE for the clinicians. And um, so the issue would be where they would see it on their priority list. And, um, but it's not out of the realm of possibility, certainly. Casey. I just wanted to quickly add that um, that University of Maryland through the PGRN project also does some um, pharmacogenomics work with uh, the VA, so that could be another site for um, the sandbox. Okay, so um, I haven't heard anybody that thinks this is a terrible idea. Um, because yeah. one nuance that I think we should maybe talk about a little bit and ask for your guidance, particularly from institute types and the like is, you know, in these kinds of papers, for example, the um, AMIA board position statement on usability last summer, we actually made recommendations to particular agencies for particular parts of the problem. And that's presumptuous at a level, but, you know, might help to focus the conversation for the several different pieces that need to be correlated. Is that a good idea? Yeah. I think, I think in general it's a very good idea. It's, it's, it helps to have a strong scientific foundation for, for those and to, and to clear, you know, clearly show what that foundation is. Um, yeah, but, you know, briefly and succinctly, but in a compelling way. Uh, but, but, yeah, it's very helpful to have those. So the, the group that I, that I hear that, um, and I'll, I'll just kind of start to volunteer some people, and if anybody falls over, you know, collapses or shows, you know, elevated blood pressure will <laughs> maybe reconsider. Um, but it sounds like the group that might be, um, you know, willing to move this forward and have the uh, appropriate connections uh, to the various pieces uh, would be uh, Josh Peterson, Ken, Casey, uh, and then uh, Betsy. And, uh, and I don't know, Terry, if, if you would want to be engaged in that. Or, or one of your minions, yes. Uh, and Ken Wiley, I, I see uh, uh, raising his hand back there. So, uh, uh, thank you, Ken. Does that seem like a reasonable uh, group that could uh, that could move this forward? Just could you define this very clearly? So, so the this <laughs> is uh, is first of all identification of three to five um, pharmacogenomic um, clinical decision support rules. Um, you know, or use cases um, that could be then um, moved uh, through the process to be represented in the ONC ARC um, nascent clinical decision support repository, whatever they're calling it. And I think Blackford has captured the different um, uh, groups that would be there, include eMERGE PGX, VA. Uh, NLM, um, University of Maryland, Vanderbilt. Um, Bob? It, so one other group that could be um, leveraged here is the PGRN TPP project, uh, which has eight different sites that are all um, uh, 
implementing their own PGX rules. And we've already done initial surveys about who's doing what there. So if in the course of putting together the, and identifying these three to five use cases, if you wanted to contact uh, TPP, let me know. I can set that up. That would be great. So we'll, we'll add Bob to the. I need a translation. <laughs> you didn't like all the acronyms? So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, PGRN, Pharmacogenomics Research Network, um, and the TPP is the Translational Pharmacogenomics Project led by uh, Alan Schuldiner at University of Maryland. Right, so we have the Maryland connection and a couple um, um, uh, pieces there, and in his, in his remaining 20 percent time as a faculty member at Maryland, we can maybe task him to, to do that. But yeah, Bob, if you're willing, let's go ahead and, and engage that, because I think it would be nice to be able to not solely rely on one project. If we can have a couple of projects coming together and say, yes, we all agree that this is something where the evidence is sufficient, that would be a good thing. Okay, great. Um, let's see, what did I do? Our, can, we get slides? can we get the slides back up? I, I don't know. I, I may have hit something by mistake. Well, um, the next one I, I, that came up a couple of times, and Ken, I wanted to um, uh, uh, you, you know, toss this to you to start with. So you mentioned you know, one of the things that I think came out of the discussion is a very high value. Uh, opportunity relates to the, um, you know, this developmental environment, the sandbox. Um, and, you know, you obviously are involved in some efforts uh, that are going forward. And so I guess the question I would start off with is that if we think that this is something that would be important, um, what would be the opportunity to take advantage of what uh, VA is doing, um, given that it is open source, what in your view would be um, uh, uh, required to uh, uh, to move this forward or make it uh, available for, for um, people in this space to be able to use? So um, the intent always was to uh, make it open and to make it publicly available. Uh, this is something like I, I've been talking to them about contributing our software, for example, for s at least several months now. Um, I think it's going to happen and it's really just a matter of uh, just identifying who wants to engage and if other people have any other open source software they want to contribute. Um, and I know Brandon, when he did his work, we did it with Tolvin, another open source EHR, but if we can identify anybody else who wants to uh, integrate other than um, uh, uh, Vista or whatnot, I th like OpenMRS, et cetera, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities and this is exactly what this effort was meant to do. And of note, Cognitive has done uh, genomics-related stuff for the Department of Defense, the prime contractor for this, too. So they have a decent amount, amount of experience in this area. I was just going to say, maybe, <clears throat> we've, we've chatted about this before, but never got to do it. You know, maybe taking the open knowledge repository stuff from CDSC and, you know, changing its foundation to be the open CDS infrastructure. We should have, uh, we should consider some kind of open library as part of the, you know, the architecture. I, 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 at least so far, almost every group contributing to this is using the most liberal soft, software license possible, which is Apache 2, which basically means free and you can do whatever you want with it, commercialize it, no restrictions. So I, I, th I think as long as we can keep to licensing models that basically have no strings attached, I think it can be a pretty easy collaborative area. So besides you, um, are there other folks sitting around the table that are currently involved in this effort? I don't think so. I mean, Brandon, uh, Guilherme with this open info button, we're planning to uh, plug in there too. Um, we were going to uh, talk with Davide Starr, try to get his uh, 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 work in there built around building these knowledge artifacts. Uh, we, we've been talking to Jyoti uh, over at uh, Mayo to see if we can uh, collaborate there. But I mean, bottom line, most of the folks we're talking to have licenses, licensing policies, which basically mean you can do whatever you want, which makes it very easy to collaborate. So I guess then the question to the group would be, um, if we in fact um, uh, endorse the idea that um, this would be a great opportunity to experiment with some of the things that we want to do, so if we think back to uh, the prior slide where there's a lot of issues related to the standards and around knowledge management that, you know, we really need this type of a developmental environment that, you know, can be contributory. Where would the, um, uh, where would the strongest opportunities be within existing 
uh, NHGRI funded projects and, and who might be some of the key individuals that are either here or potentially not in the room, but we might be able to uh, volunteer in the role of uh, we are their boss uh, to say, hey, guess what you're going to be doing uh, uh, is you're, you're going to be doing this. So uh, do we have some ideas around that? It is. To be specific, so you're, you're asking what are the strongest opportunities within existing NHGRI projects for national development certified EHR environment for what? R right. So in other words, um, I think what we're saying here is, is that we recognize that there are, well, first of all, we recognize two things. One is that there are certain existing standards that we may or may not be leveraging as well as we could leverage in our, in our projects, which means we could be developing, uh, you know, uh, uh, inefficiencies. Um, but the second thing is, is that there may be gaps in what's currently available in the existing standards that we could then contribute to and fill those gaps based on our knowledge in this uh, specific area. And so the, the idea would be is, you know, actively participating in this type of a uh, developmental environment uh, would uh, make it easier for us to do the work that we need to do by leveraging existing standards, but also uh, would um, move the ability for everybody else to do it uh, forward in a, in a faster way. D did you want to say something in, in follow-up to that? Yeah, I was, I was going to say probably of our portfolio and the six or so that people have been mentioning repeatedly, the, the two that are most relevant to sort of system-wide implementation are Emerge and, and Ignite. Um, there, are, there are many other projects that kind of touch on this, but, but those would be the two main ones, I would think. Right. And that was my thought as well. Um, Lee? Yeah, um, we we actually uh, recently founded by NOM uh, developing uh, pharmacogenetics and uh, uh, also uh, drug interaction uh, ontologies, uh, uh, trying to sy sy synthesize the uh, uh, annotation uh, uh, of uh, clinical evidence. And uh, uh, one of my collaborator uh, friends in the Pittsburgh also being founded by NOM and doing similar thing as well. So we're thinking about that domain of uh, uh, research activity can be really useful for uh, some kind of knowledge presentation as well. So that's something we can basically contribute to this, you know, uh, uh, um, group as well. You know, maybe, maybe one point to try to clarify is what is the sandbox notion really going to be used for versus what is a sort of demonstration at scale project going to entail? Um, in some ways, I think the sandbox is a place to sort of test concepts, test representations, you know, test in a, in a laboratory kind of, you know, uh, environment. But then we'll need vendors who will say, you know, we understand what you're doing, we understand the interface or the APIs, developing test harnesses and stuff like that. So I want to make sure we get those two notions going forward. Yeah, and I, I think that's definitely right. I, I think. Um, I mean, we're not doing a sandbox for the sake of doing a sandbox. We're doing a sandbox, obviously, so that we can take the tools and apply it in uh, settings other than the VA. Um, although the VA, it's, it's, it would be nice because it's the same infrastructure. It should port over nicely and they're a big site. Um, I think the primary challenges for vended systems are use, use licenses don't allow it to, for example, just put it in a sandbox. So we'll need to do it in our own environments after that. I think. Uh the work that I did with Ken was largely a, a, a sandbox. You know, we, we tested out, and, and I think what we're going for is largely what we did, but that was me as a PhD student without any, you know, NHGRI funding or anything like that. So, I mean, I think that's probably, the, from what I've heard, that's probably the closest thing to what we're looking for, but that wasn't funded by anything, any of these agencies. We all know that uh, the uh, work of masters and PhD students is uh, a great force multiplier. Uh, uh, since so we can ask you to do any number of things without anything other than a salary, uh, so that's uh, that is highly Not useful. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> right, Jim. I think the vendor point is really important because, and, and maybe this is horribly narrow of me, but there's a community that thinks in, they don't think in terms of open CDS, you know, unfortunately, or all these other things we've been talking about. They think in terms of Cerner or Epic or whatever. And they say to somebody like us, oh, it's cool what you've done. Show, we're Cerner too, show me what you've done. And, and that's their total context. And they, there's people that want to do this, and you know, they need it in some you know, form that, that goes in terms of their vendor. I, I think the competitive issues with the vendors are definitely going to be a challenge. But one model we did at Cerner while I was there is we had um, Vic Deshmick from University of Utah 
come to Cerner, spent a summer and did an internship project. We simulated allele representation in the decision support engine, gathered data, published a paper on it. So that's another model that, that, that might work rather than creating a wide open sandbox that I doubt that Cerner, Epic, there, there's just too many things that that could be a Acknowledged and I mean, from a day job perspective, we're going to be building it into our own systems. So with Cerner, we built in the discern um, uh, advisor capability, which is basically building in these apps that are triggered by the rules engine discern expert. With Epic, we're looking at how we can use uh, ClinkAB, which is an approach where you can build in apps into Epic and their uh, rules engine. Uh, BPAs can actually call out to services like OpenCDS with their latest release that we're planning on using, et cetera. So I, I think because so many of us now live in vended system environments for our day jobs, we need to, and we will be using operational dollars. If Research dollars is nice, but we will be using operational dollars to make some of this happen. And I, I was, I mean, I was just going to uh, you know, point out here in, in the vendor relationship stuff, we might want to just build on some of the existing relationships that we've done some of these trials with before because they were willing to do wild stuff. And maybe new uh, partners would be interested in, in doing that as well. The other approach is some of the vendors, for example, Allscripts, offers a, uh, an application development environment, SDK, for you to build stuff that they will vet and use. So that might be a, a, a possibility as well. Right. So I, I, I think the point of, of the, 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 you can't build, at, sorry, let me, let me figure out where I want to start. So at, at um, the University of Washington, um, we, we were trying to build on some very nice work that Casey Overby did with um, um, decision support rules for pharmacogenetics. And her, her work uh, was, um, you know, she struggled to get things into the, into the, and to figure out how, how, what a realistic use scenario would be. And we struggled with the same thing and you know, tried, tried, over, tried several times to see how we could get some realistic scenarios for physicians actually to play with that were anything like what we had in either our Epic or our Cerner systems. And, and, and we found that it was just incredibly difficult. And so the sandbox sounds incredibly appealing, um, but, but um, you know, uh, is it going to have the same limitation that, that what works in the, not, not just what functions, but what physicians interact with? Um, and and the, the key limitation that we saw was that we're, we're once, you know, we, we were doing alerts, you know, there's lots of, but, but the, the um, clinical decision support alerts, um, as they fire on a patient that has all they have is genomic information, or they only have three pieces of information, is very, very different than clinical decision support that's on a complex patient that has multiple different um, um, notes and laboratory pieces going on in, in, inside it. And that, that was the, the big challenge for us in getting kind of our, our, our limited representation to be anything close to realistic. And I don't know if, if what you envision for a sandbox will have anything close to realistic patients and, and will, will even be kind of representative of what physicians will actually be seeing on the ground. I'll just note the sandbox will have uh, simulated big data generated uh, through other contracts. That capability has been developed by Cognitive and it'll be part of the sandbox, large amounts of simulated data. So this is uh, interesting because it's beginning to um, move into another area that we have identified. And, and so one of the things that I'm sensing in the discussion here is that uh, to some degree I think we're uh, struggling with the idea of, of uh, uh, Ken, who, who knows, not, we're not struggling with Ken, but, uh, you know, Ken obviously intimately knows uh, this environment and understands what it can do and what it can't do, and the rest of us are saying, well, that seems like a cool idea, but we don't really know. So maybe the, the next step here, and I don't know if this would uh, even be possible, uh, would be some type of a, um, a demonstration or WebEx or, or something where um, you know, uh, interested people could, in fact, um, uh, see what the opportunities would be, uh, understand some of the uh, workings behind the system, and, and that might then lend itself to uh, better opportunities. So, so uh, shameless self-promotion at AMIA this next month, I'll be presenting the prototype of the work that we did. Um, I submitted a paper on it, and I'll be presenting on it at AMIA next month.
Yeah, and I think that that's great, but I, I'm really thinking about a much deeper dive where, you know, we could really begin to, uh, you know, you could walk through some of the things that you've already built in there and, and, and really uh, give a full uh, description of the functionality. Uh, is, is that a possibility? Sure, and I think just the challenge is um, in terms of how we would integrate with vended systems, I'm just not sure we're allowed to disclose all the things we know about the mechanics of how vended systems actually work because I think that's against our use policy. So acknowledging that we can talk about things, but there are some things we just cannot talk about in, unless it's other customers of that same system. Yeah, and I think that that at this point would be okay because I mean, I, while we all know that the end goal is to get these things into our systems, the reality is right now is we're, uh, I think we're much more interested in saying, you know, we have to be able to test different approaches to uh, to how this can work, and and if we leave that, you know, the 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 end game aside for the period of time, having an environment that we can uh, actually work in would be would be a good thing. So, so maybe the the action item uh, for, for this would be to um, uh, facilitate uh, doing that type of a, uh, uh, I'll just use the term WebEx or demonstration of the. Um, um, a sandbox environment. And I think for, we can include whoever wants to demonstrate anything around those areas and um, uh, so Brandon's sandbox is ready, this VA sandbox is not yet up, so once it's up we can, we can have that, but it, it may not be like next week or two weeks. Okay, so uh, this would be a, um, so the, the tickler on this will be to check in with you to say when is when when is this up and, and ready to go, and then what we can do is, uh, I'm assuming um, that uh, Terry, we could use our distribution list through uh, um, NHGRI to be able to let uh, interested parties know. Um, sorry, you mean the distribution list for this meeting? Yeah. Yeah. So as long as nobody here objects to that, that's that fine. Does that seem reasonable? Any other comments about that? Okay, so um, we started to touch on this, and I think this is another one that was um, uh, of high v uh, value, and this is the, uh, now I just have to figure out which one it is. Um, somehow it's not on here. So we, we've talked a number of times about um, understanding more about the user, uh, the end user, and I think um, we've probably spent more time t focusing on the clinician uh, end user, but the idea of the, the workflow piece and the, um, um, I know it's up here somewhere, <laughs> I just can't find it now. Uh, okay, fine. So uh, workflow, user inter interactions, uh, that type of thing, and, and we mentioned that, you know, the, the potential for the, uh, you know, the, the, the sandbox is maybe being a place to begin to explore some of those things, but also the idea of uh, developing uh, a research agenda around some of the social, cultural, social te technologic uh, aspects uh, that could influence. And in particular, uh, as Brandon pointed out, you know, trying to build uh, different approaches to clinical decision support that would fit with different use cases. And so I think there are two things that are inherent in this that would be of use. One is uh, to build a variety of use cases, and that was, I think, um, on one of the prior uh, slides, uh, 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 here we go. On K KQ3, uh, the uh, use cases to feed information to CDS systems across a variety of different uh, projects. So uh, this would that would be one piece, and then the second piece would be to then to take those use cases, you know, and whether it be in a developmental environment or or in some way, shape, or form, perhaps even you know using a paper wireframe approach like Andrea Hartzler uses uh, quite a bit at University of Washington to go to clinicians and say, okay, um, you know, this, this is what we're thinking of doing. Here are different approaches and test uh, different methods of delivering uh, clinical decision support. So that seemed to be something that was of, of strong interest to the group. Did you have a comment? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, sort of in the, in the classical development paradigm, you'd like to do a whole bunch of formative usability assessment and then some of at the end, and I guess this is where the lab and the VISTA implementation could be really interesting, may not be generally reflective of, you know, what other systems look like, but we might entice some of the vendors uh, to allow us to do some of that, uh, perhaps summative level stuff too. 
Jan? Well, well, so all of the last 25 minutes or so, I, it has a strongly organizational development focus. And, and I, I guess the, the question would be if this all turns on a public library uh, uh, infrastructure, then, then that's also a big socio-technical um, R&D thing. And wh where do we envision um, you know, a prototype which is the entire enchilada, including the public library, uh, a prototype of it. It doesn't have to be its final, res you know, its final supporting organization, but some notion that you have to have this pooling of the accumulated knowledge and then you redistribute it and all that, that sort of thing um, could be left out of all this, at least as we've discussed it, and, and I don't know if it's a separate thing or whether we want to make it a holistic uh, picture. So, uh, fortuitously, the VA actually commissioned some prototype work on in building that, so the same group has built the initial knowledge repository with a rating system where people can rate what they want and identify resources, et cetera. Obviously, it's not something that would scale for nationwide use, but I think there are other efforts like at AHRQ with USHIC, and uh, I, I think by just talking to AHRQ, ONC, et cetera, because this discussion is coming up, where do you have a national knowledge repository? I, I think that can be def solved by just talking to the right people where uh, they recognize the need and are planning to build something like that. Well, you could solve it that way, but I'm much more intrigued by the idea that you sort of post an RFA for the best creative ideas of how you create. And it might map exactly or closely to something that already exists, or maybe it's altogether a brand new clean sheet of paper approach to how you might do this using uh, extant state-of-the-art tools and stuff, which would be much more in the kind of spirit of the output of a workshop like this, rather than kind of in a contracting way, just extending something you already or basically blessing something that already exists. And, and it, it's not clear, actually, if this is, you know, going to be a <clears throat> academic venture or if, if things work, look good, uh, work and look good, work well and look good. You know, could the commercial enterprises take an interest? Um, could be that way as well. Yeah, I, and I guess getting back to the point that you're making, Dan, again, this uh, relates to the sort of the exceptionalism piece, which is um, uh, is what uh, you were proposing um, specifically related to some of the genomic CDS or is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, a broader perspective of which genomic would be one piece of it? Um, and that's relevant from the, from the idea of, you know, if there would be such an RFA that would be developed, you know, where would it be likely to come from since, you know, to some degree we're providing some level of guidance, uh, maybe that's the wrong word, um, you know, to, to, to Genome, the convener, to say, okay, is this, you know, is this something you should be involved in or not involved in? Well, and so they have the option to either, it's important enough to Genome that they want to do it themselves or they can find partners and especially for things that have broad applicability and I think there are multiple right solutions here, but, but it, my guess would be it's a socio-technical thing. The technical thing does have a gene genome, genomic medicine specific piece, the socio piece of it, it, look, it looks like it would be entirely reusable if you had a public library, right? Could be all decision support. Although there are, there, there are some interesting, um, potentially interesting uh, policy issues related to some of the um, um, uh, regulations relating to genomic information as opposed to other information where it is treated somewhat differently that, that might, you know, present some unique um, or, or at least um, um, challenging um, uh, issues uh, to, you know, stand up a library of that type, you know, are, are that, that, you know, would be within the policy um, uh, realm to potentially explore in terms of the implications of, of GINA or whatever related to this type of activity. You'd hope that doesn't lead to kind of separatist uh, insulated development because it, it clearly I mean, speaks to the notion of escalating complexity and, and clinicians having to navigate in, in a knowledge space that's just way, way too deep in all dimensions. And, and so I think taking advantage of genetic exceptionalism might be good in the short run, but probably kind of, it sort of generally senses that would be bad in the long run. And just to note, I, we were talking some, some production level issues of how would we stand up something that is the knowledge repository for genomic medicine in the country, that kind of thing. I think we just need to keep our expectations for like what we do in like a sandbox and et cetera, 
to not get to that level. Uh, I, I, I think in the, I mean, what we, I, I think, should do is build initial prototypes, show how it can be done, and then let, you know, other later me mechanisms, uh, approaches to build the production great things or to uh, have commercial entities step in to build. I think the key is to define the standards and the interfaces so that whatever we build can be replaced gracefully by better things later. Yeah, and Eric, who just left, has repeat, repeatedly said that NHGRI and, and Terry as well, that you know they view their proper position is to be trailblazer or pathfinder, support those kinds of activities, and then you know when things if things demonstrate their value, someone else kind of does the hardening and up scaling it up and all that sort of thing. And, and this seems like it's in that space naturally. So, um, you know, to again, uh, maybe pull back a bit and make sure I'm, I'm clear. Um, based on the, the conversations that I'm hearing, I think that um, the idea of this, you know, the, the end game, the library, the repository, clearly has to be on the uh, radar screen, but perhaps um, has the potential to, uh, if we start with that, or at least make say that we have to have that as piece of where we begin, that it could potentially slow down some of the uh, some of the early work, and so uh, that what we might want to uh, think about is staging this such that we would begin to do the um, uh, experiments with the use cases and that, uh, and with the idea that as we learn more and get them to the closer to what might be considered a production version that we then begin to think about um, uh, that repository, which may be, you know, we may have more options at that point in time. Yeah, although I'm reminded that in the National Library of Medicine's long range plan, the original one, uh, Ed Feigenbaum said, recommended the library repeatedly be extravagant in your demands on the technology, right? So don't, because if you set the bar low and you think that all you could achieve is this, that's exactly where you'll end up. Whereas if you set the expectation very high, you may still end up at the lower level, but, but you have a pathway to something bigger. So it's, I think, uh, in the nature of these workshops to view a, a broader, uh, a better world and, and not be constrained by, well, we couldn't possibly do that uh, as extensions to what we're currently doing. And, and I, would, I would agree and underscore the notion of describing the ideal state inclusive of all its components holistically, but then parsing you know, into incremental research paths to get to that vision, then they all actually can coordinate. And we have another long range planning effort coming up very soon at the National Library of Medicine, so this workshop can be partial input to that as well. Um, I, I do think that there could be easily a distinction between what would be the most robust, uh, long, you know, longer term uh, instantiation of a public library of CDS in this area and other areas. And to get back to Ken's point, what we might do to um, illustrate the utility and the immediate benefit of this by integrating it with some you know, at a, at a different level with some things that people are already using, you know, or, or are the place where the next set of things might do. So I think probably we want to do both of those things. All right, so you may guess what I'll be talking about, <laughs> the research aspect of the valuable information that will be there. And the clinical, I mean, I understand 80 or 90 percent of the research should be medical informatics, but I would challenge you to expand uh, you know, your perspective on the opportunities that are unique with genomic data that are not necessarily of the same quantity and perhaps quality as other types of, uh, you know, medical uh, tests that are being administered. And this is the volume of the data and actually the opportunity to take this clinical information and even information about uh, decisions made uh, based on that data and then uh, do research that's more focused on, on mechanisms, biology, and so on, using that, so to speak, phenotyping data and uh, clinical decision making with outcomes and so on as a kind of phenotype, very complex phenotype, and then look at genomic data and patterns, biomarkers, and so on that may be, then be mined from it. Now, the, the kind of genomic data that's then used is actually much broader, much larger than the one used in the decision making. Uh, and it may not be validated, but keeping uh, 
this data integrated and making this translational research opportunity available to genomic scientists and, and others actually would be uh, of high value. And it may translate in the long run into the knowledge that will then feed back into your knowledge systems, you know, validated tests and so on. So, Alex, let me just uh, push you on, on, on this point. <clears throat> Could you envision developing a set of use cases to describe uh, what uh, you just articulated that could be then potentially tested in this type of an environment? Because we've listed uh, in, in our examples here, you know, uh, things like uh, BD2K as a potential source. Um, so from my view, you know, we want a, a, the broadest representation of use cases that we could have with owners that want to test, you know, just what they can do. So is that something that you would see as feasible? Uh, I definitely do. You know, one example, and I'm not uh, you know, a medical doctor, I, I wouldn't need input from, from you, but one example that comes to mind is searching for, you know, predictors of adverse outcomes or of, uh, you know, uh, predictors of lack of efficiency of certain relatively new drugs, uh, you know, preventing harm uh, based on genomic uh, biomarkers uh, that may lead then to a better understanding of biology uh, or pharmacogenetics and so on, yeah. So in some ways, some of the things you've mentioned there are almost, um, and, and this could actually relate to some of the public health uh, issues we talked about. You know, some of this would almost be a post-market surveillance type of, uh, of piece uh, that would uh, definitely tie into something that uh, FDA is clearly interested in uh, and others are clearly interested in. Um, so that would, I think, be, would be a potential utility. Sorry, can I keep interrupting you? So just a few notes. I mean, obviously, this kind of a sandbox would not have actual patient data. So we could create the mechanisms to do the predictive mm -hmm. analytics, et cetera, mm -hmm. and then port it in your own environment to work on it. And I think one thing I'm, I'm hearing is people want to get to the, to the zenith, and I think it makes sense. Uh, I think it just makes sense to do the typical agile thing where before we sort of try to do perfection, let's have something that works and then incrementally make it better so we always have something that works. So what I'm, um, the way I'm thinking about potentially, and again, I, I'm not hearing any, you know, dissent around the group. Uh, about that this isn't a, a strong thing to do, and I think the prior discussions uh, reinforce that this is uh, something of interest. So we, I have a number of, uh, of groups listed up here, um, uh, and it seems to me that, you know, maybe uh, the first step in this would be to reach out to these different groups, and again, this is not necessarily an all-inclusive list, and some of them, of course, aren't even in existence at the present time, although we anticipate they will be shortly. Um, to say, you know, we would like to solicit from you um, a set of use cases. We would obviously have to provide some, you know, parameters about what we would like to see and, um, uh, and, and, and to some degree some of the, the, the formatting uh, would need to have some consistency across it, but then we would begin to have a collection of things that would, you know, span across uh, the diversity that we want to look at. Uh, that would be the, uh, where we could then use that as the jumping off point to um, uh, begin to choose those that we can um, test and, and learn from. So uh, that seems to be a relatively low energy sort of recommendation um, from the group that would be um, a request I think that would presumably since I think most, not all, but most of the ones that are listed up there are um, uh, NHGRI funded, um, is, is that a reasonable um, uh, request to make of these groups to ask them to, to submit something like this, do you think, Terry? So again, you need to make this, the request fairly specific and, and make it also clear what the, what the objective is, um, because not everybody would have, have been part of this conversation. But, but yeah, I, I think we could we can certainly ask. And do we have, um, I know that CSER and, and eMERGE do, but do the other groups um, also have sort of um, informatics um, um, uh, interest uh, or uh, working groups or, or something associated with them that would be the logical point of contact? Yeah, um, UDN does. I'm not sure about Ignite. Maybe maybe Josh Denny would know. Um, so, but but you know, sending it to the the chair, which is Jeff, 
um, Ginsburg unfortunately had to go. Um, you know, that, that would be the way to, to explore with them. There's not an informatics group in Ignite yet, is there? Or did you start one? We keep talking about starting one, but it hasn't happened yet. It will probably spontaneously form at some point. It will spontaneously ignite? Is that what you're saying, Josh? Ooh. <laughs> Adam. Let's hope we don't have any spontaneous uh, ignition here. I, I, sorry, I, I had scheduled a conference call over the actual break, so I, had a, I, I missed most of the conversation. Have you discussed any um, more international kind of aspect to this? Uh, I know uh, groups like Global Alliance uh, and G2MC both are focusing on a uh, international slant for IT and bioinformatics. Uh, it might be worth sort of thinking about bringing that context into this discussion. Well, I know that um, the um, GM5 meeting, was it was that our global meeting? Six. Um, that one of the active working groups that came out of that meeting actually is the informatics group. And, Yes, yeah, Steve Blyle from right. Inner Mountain. So, and that's I, the, that's G two MC. That's in that's that's okay. inside G two MC. Yeah, yeah, again, we're we're in acronym hell yeah, here. No, so, uh, <laughs> that's you know. right. uh, but the global the genomic alliance for right. global health, G A four G H, um, yeah. has also a, a very active bioinformatics group. But remember, they are f mainly focused on research and pooling data and making it available for research. So, how relevant they might be to this, I'm not I'm not sure. Right, but certainly, I think the. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the informatics group that Steve is leading um, would, would certainly be able to do that, so we should add that to, the, to our list up there as well. Steve, Steve Blyle, B-L-E-Y-L. And it's actually chaired with, by uh, Steve and Eric Ligo, so from Estonia. There's a lot going on in Europe in, in this, and it would be cool but rather daunting um, to, <laughs> to engage all of that, uh, but something to, to think about at least. Yeah, but one of the things that we did uh, articulate in our key objectives was national and international, so I think if we can demonstrate that we're actually trying to uh, move it from that perspective, that would be a really good thing to, uh, to do. So I think that that's probably the... Um, uh, the initial action item. Now, the, the question then would be is, um, you know, uh, who, who would make the request and, and sort of who would then uh, collect the use cases and then, and then move that forward? Um, and uh, I guess that's sort of a, a, a thinly veiled um, uh, a request for volunteers <laughs> uh, related to that. One, one group that could not volunteer is, is any government agency because this, this in, a, in a way, is, is kind of soliciting for things that we're not supposed to solicit for. So, um, so it, it couldn't be us, even though in some ways it might be logical for, for a request to come through us, but some of our you know, collaborative groups potentially would, might be interested. And um, I know we have... Uh, you know, we have joint calls with um, Emerge Caesar, so maybe, um, maybe Brian, you and, you and I could uh, uh, potentially get started with those two groups and, and just kind of see how that, uh, uh, how that goes, and then we could put, potentially extend it from there. Is, is that okay? Sure, let's talk about it later. Okay. All right. Um, I think that that probably um, is sufficient for that right now. Um, so let's take a look at uh, some of the other ones that we have um, uh, listed here. I think the other one that we've spent a lot of time and there's been a lot of uh, interest in, in talking about is is the end to end project. Uh, the um, uh, you know, how that might look. And, and in my view, um, this is probably something that's much more in a um, visioning or developmental stage. In other words, you know, what would this actually look like? We've talked over the course of the two days about the different pieces that would be potentially needed, um, but I don't think that they've necessarily coalesced into an obvious um, uh, uh, <coughs> Way to, way to move forward. So um, it would seem that, uh, you know, if there was a, 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 a group of folks that was interested in sort of laying out what 
uh, an end-to-end -end project might actually look like, you know, almost like a, a you know, a fishbone or something of that nature to say, what are all the different components that are needed? What do we have? What don't we have? Where are the, the um, potential uh, things that need to be solved or that could be studied? Uh, that that could be of some, um, that that could be of some use. So I just put that out there as a potential um, uh, for discussion. And uh, I'm not aware, but I, I thought I've heard notions of the, uh, some of the Vanderbilt work, Josh and Josh and Dan, you know, is this something that, you know, could leverage predict work and think about an end-to-end -end project with predict? Uh, absolutely. In fact, we've, you know, put together some proposals and that sort of thing to do exactly that. So are you volunteering, Blackford? No, predict is volunteering. I heard Josh. <laughs> <laughs> do you want? Do you want it? Uh, I don't want to. I mean, I know you're involved in a lot of different things, but do you want to? Would you like to lead out on this, Josh? Let me learn a little more about the details, and then I'll get back to you. But okay. I, it sounds it sounds very promising for predict. I think it's probably a good use case. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> What, what does it pay? Twi uh, Terry just said twice what you're currently getting, so. <laughs> For this meeting. Yeah, but it's all psychic income. It's in Canadian dollars, Dan, so it's a <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me ask, you know, um, are there other uh, folks that, um, uh, you know, are particularly interested in this that uh, might, uh, uh, you know, be willing to um, uh, talk with Josh uh, around this, uh, this area uh, going forward? So Sandy? And Lee? So I'm speaking for my friend Paul. He just left. So he is actually in charge of a, a couple of projects implementation in Indiana University. So he's very, I was, he was very happy to work with uh, whoever in this particular component. Okay. And, and sorry, just to hop on, he's also part of Ignite, and we have very similar overlapping projects. So there are a lot okay. of collaborations there. Okay, that sounds good. And it's always good to volunteer people that aren't here and can't defend themselves. So. Yeah, when I was raising my hand, I'm happy to, to, to work on this, but um, the IOM group has also been beginning to look at what are the challenges associated with each of the different actors that need to come together in order for end-to-end -end cl clinical decision support to work so we could share information as that develops too. Okay, so to have you as part of this then I think would allow for that type of coordination. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a, uh, that that's a really good, um, good idea. So that seems like a reason. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to refine my answer with all the uh, volunteers. Uh, uh, I will give it a big thumbs up from my point of view. I think uh, having members of this group join would be terrific. Okay, great. And one of the beauties actually of having three different threads contributing to the weaving of this vision um, is to compare and contrast and take the best of whatever is being done. Good. Anybody else uh, interested? Uh, Mark Hoffman will also. Great. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about, um, and this is uh, this is something that uh, um, has been successful in, in, in uh, as an outcome of some of the meetings, and, and not as successful for uh, for others, has been uh, the role of the larger group uh, in terms of um, you know continuing to um, uh, get together to kind of hear. Uh, report outs from the different uh, working groups. So one one potential outcome is to have, you know, this group um, with some working groups that could then, you know, be reconvened over time uh, to potentially uh, do that. Now, one of the challenges, of course, with this is that there, uh, for convening a group like this, there are uh, costs involved, even if, you know, one tries to do this uh, telephonically, and, and uh, there's been some experience with the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee in terms of convening this that I think had some success. And so, um, uh, but I also uh, know that um, the, the capacity of, you know, genome to, to manage all of these is, uh, is also finite. And so um, this may be leaping ahead a bit, but now that we have three or four different things that um, are coming out of this, that I think are engaging the larger group. In some ways, there I could see value to re, you know uh, bringing this back to the larger group for comment and and uh, 
and coordination. So I don't know if, if that would be something that would be potentially on the table to explore, he says, looking at Terry. We can always consider it. I, I, I'm just, I'm uh, reluctant to commit to, to it, mainly because we're, we're struggling to keep up with the ones we have. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I don't want to then, you know, sink those as well as not do a good job on this one. Um, so I guess it, we'd want to see, you know, how much of a need there would be. And, and yeah, I think working, you know, most of the work gets done in working groups anyway. And, and to the degree that things could sort of be sent out for, for broad comment, if people want to comment, that's great. We could put up together a, a website that where they could look at things and comment on them even passively. Um, arranging calls and having minutes and that sort of thing gets into, you know, a space where we, we just may not be able to handle it. So th that raises uh, two questions. One is, I guess, the sense of the group in terms of the uh, value of having, uh, you know, that larger set of input and, you know, uh, doing it, you know, through uh, electronic means. The second uh, is, is um, are, would there be another entity that could potentially be the convener going forward uh, of the group, and you know again, whether that would be you know Amy Gen Amy a genomics interest group or or something uh, of that nature. No, no so I, I think the IOM's uh, you know uh, initiative initiatives which are roughly clustered around the learning healthcare system and its various components um, is. I mean, they're also resource constrained and bandwidth constrained, but but it would be a natural alliance, if not a home, if they really get fired up about it. So maybe Adam, um, I don't know if, if you want to uh, specifically um, uh, comment or uh, deny or uh, <laughs> or just write a now, check. Now that Dan has put you on the spot. Yeah, I wasn't quite ready to be put on the spot for this one. Uh, so. There's a lot of activities going on uh, at the IOM around a learning healthcare system, uh, some within my group, some within other groups. Uh, so I certainly couldn't speak for the entirety of all the activities that are going on. Uh, we're currently hosting the, IOM, the our action collaborative on genomic information integration to the EHR. Uh, and I think aligning, having, you know, for instance, the two of you joining that is going to help bring these groups together. At the moment, I couldn't commit to actually housing another group like this, though this is uh, a bit beyond our, our current constraints. So. so let me just maybe um, take a straw poll um, and, and just get uh, how many uh, people around, uh, I'm going to give you three options here. Mm -hmm. um, one would uh, be uh, how many people think it would be essential for the large group to get together to uh, review the work? How many people think it would be uh, great if it could happen, but not essential. How many people think that would be a big waste of my time? So uh, how many th people think it would be absolutely essential that a group like this would, would reconvene periodically? So Cerner is willing to, uh, to take this on uh, and fund uh, th this. JD, this is, this is I, I would never have thought, but given you were the only person to raise your hand, it just seems natural to me that no, I'm that's, Okay, I I I, I I'm sold. <laughs> this is and this may be the first public-private partnership. I mean, my God, add that to your resume uh, for the year-end report, right? Uh, th that's that's really phenomenal. So we'll. Um, I think what we'll uh, do in the spirit of that is that uh, since Blackford and I are, um, I, I committed him before he actually truly said yes, so he's, it's like dog shaming on YouTube. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, at any rate, uh, since we're you know, going to be participating there, then we'll just, as part of that, uh, plan to um, uh, uh, explore how we move that forward and then think about when would be the right time uh, to, uh, to reconvene the group. But that would be uh, fantastic. Great, thank you. So, JD, <clears throat> thank you, and I think it's uh, you know extraordinary leadership and enlightenment for a vendor to take that kind of position. But one might ask, you know, would you be willing to have some of your compatriots in attendance in obs observational status or participating? Absolutely, because I mean, the place where we would host it, it we, it's in our vision center where, as Mark remembers, it's where we host client activities. There's a very large amphitheater auditorium in there that doesn't really say Cerner. I don't, Mark, I don't even think there's a logo inside. And so we can set this up as a very benign, vendor-neutral 
way. I mean, for example, on a much smaller scale, we host the CLMA chapter meetings in the KC metro area where you've got various EMR, various LS types, clients, if you will, coming to that with no issues whatsoever. Thank you. That's perfect. Sure. Great. Okay. Um, so let's see here. We've ticked off a number of these. Um, those are the ones uh, in the list of the two slides here that uh, I think there was the most um, excitement and discussion about. Let's um, just kind of go through the, um, uh, the re remainder and get a sense for um, uh, where people are um, uh, thinking uh, it might be good because we have, you know, we all have a limited limitation of bandwidth and while it would be great to do everything, I think we also know that that's not realistic. Um, so let's just kind of get a sense here. So the ones that are um, uh, kind of leftovers here are the business case ROI, clinical epidemiology. I think the ideal presentation layer, that is now sort of fitting into the the sandbox uh, developmental environment. So I think we have included that one in our broader discussion about uh, the use cases. Um, we have uh, this large area of standards, which is always uh, uh, can represent a bit of a, uh, a morass. Um, uh, <laughs> lots of lives have been lost. That's, in the, related, uh, that's related to the sandbox, though, because the sandbox won't form. Yes. The so, okay. So, do we want to declare that as part of the sandbox and move on? Yes. Okay, great. That's good. That works for me. Uh, we talked about the demonstration project. We haven't talked uh, yet uh, too much about um, whether or not uh, engagement with uh, public health outside of the um, potential use case around uh, newborn screening, which is one of the largest public health uh, um, projects, if not the largest uh, public health project that is uh, focused around a lot of genetic uh, disease. Um, and then the other thing that we haven't talked much about at all is the uh, role of the uh, patient caregiver and, and how uh, they may play a role uh, in this. Um, we did talked about the exploring different types and then uh, the funded CDS center, uh, which came up in the discussion. So let's um, go back here and just kind of by show of hands, how many think um, uh, that developing some work around a uh, business case return on investment would be a really important thing uh, for this group to do. Just raise them high. And I'm, I'm going to hold up Jeff Ginsburg's hand because he's not here and he would certainly be voting for that. Okay, so I, probably about half the folks, okay. Um, clinical epidemiology, health services research, uh, what is baseline for genomic clinical decision support? Okay, perhaps a few less there. Um, uh, public uh, health versus the uh, public's health, um, you know, public health role in uh, some of the issues relating to maintenance of genomic information, uh, portability, uh, those sorts of things. How many people would be interested in exploring that space? Well, we hadn't we hadn't put those. Yeah. Right. Yes, I think that's correct. Although I think the point that was uh, being made earlier was that you know our current EHR systems do in fact have a role in some of that public health reporting, and that you know again this may be something that's a little bit farther uh, down the road. Alex, would post market surveillance fall into this category? Well, that's true. We did bring that up, and we didn't specifically attach that to anything, but that would be something that would clearly, I think, fall into that, you know. That's an overlap between research and uh, care, yeah. public health. Yeah, so we should, I think it would be fair to add that um, um, uh, under that uh, public health uh, role. Yeah, I would be interested in that. Yeah. yeah. So if we, so if we, um, I'm sorry. Jesse just volunteered by Twitter. Just to kind of jump. Oh, good. Oh, to do to lead the public health. Uh, to read what she said. Yeah. She said somebody should be involved. Uh, that was 11 minutes. 
11 minutes ago. Uh-oh. <laughs> anything tough about this then. <laughs> so anything that has not attached, we can volunteer Jesse for. Okay, great. I like that. Okay, we're, we are pulling up Jesse's Twitter feed, so uh, Blackford will, will uh, parse this in just a second. So, um, so, the, so the things that I might add to public health to kind of, again, um, uh, compress our list a bit uh, would be the uh, post-market surveillance, and then I think also the, uh, perhaps the newborn screening uh, piece um, could be a part of that as well. I think I would probably not include the patient-facing activities as part of this at the present time. That's, but where does it go? Uh, well, I think that is a separate bullet. Okay, so any, any disagreements with that sort of reorganization? So given how we've reorganized that, then uh, what's the level of interest in terms of what we're constituting as this public health, public's health uh, view? Okay, it didn't help as much. David's not holding his hand up, uh, even though he's running the Newborn Screening Translational Research Network, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and then uh, on this one, the uh, exploration of the role of the patient uh, caregiver for uh, genomic uh, CDS. Um, uh, so this would be patient-facing decision support, patient um, uh, ownership of data, uh, transportability, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and again, the idea that uh, this could be potentially a role where um, uh, looking for uh, co-funding opportunities uh, with um, PCORI. And I didn't mention before, um, that, you know, with the different PCORnet um, uh, 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 networks, both the, uh, the patient research network and the um, um, healthcare delivery system research network that are uh, being pushed together, um, there's an infrastructure uh, there that, you know, addresses or overlaps a lot with um, some of the projects that we're doing that look, are looking at EHR. Uh, data and patient-entered data. Now, they're not nearly at the level of maturity um, uh, that, you know, a lot of our efforts are at, uh, but they're certainly making um, uh, an, an, an effort to say how can we aggregate data across, you know, groups of systems that have, you know, tens of millions of patients uh, uh, to do this. So, um, uh, and the other thing that PCORI uh, is called out specifically in their enabling legislation is a focus on uh, rare disease, which they uh, frankly have not had a tremendous amount of success in terms of finding projects that are fundable in that space. And so it is an area that I think gives a leg up if that was a potential area of focus for, um, for what we wanted to do in, in, the, in the CDS realm. So with, with those uh, additional uh, areas of expansion, uh, what's the level of interest uh, around um, the role of the patient caregiver. How many people would be interested in exploring that? Okay. We have a few that are, are, are certainly interested in, in that area. Um, so I think, whoops. Um, I think there was probably most uh, interest related to the um, uh, to the business case return on investment. I seem to see more hands um, raised around that. Um, so let's have some discussion about what a project um, might potentially look like. What would be the components? What, what would be the sorts of things that we would want to study? I just want to mention there's already a, a Health Economics U01 uh, that is funded and includes a number of genetic use cases. I will say that the part um, that is not well um, defined within that group would be the technology side. And so to the extent that this might be focused on technology, I think it would be a nice complement to that, that work. And, and remind me, I, I, I know we responded to that one and, and, uh, and didn't make the cut, but is that through NHGRI or? It's through the Common Fund. Oh, that's right. It was a Common Fund initiative. Right. Okay. So what's the, um, so again, thinking about the opportunity for, uh, for collaboration and, and maybe your perspective and, and maybe Terry's perspective as well in terms of what, wh how we might be able to engage with that group to perhaps explore some of these opportunities. So uh, they are right now trying to put together um, 
a large stakeholder meeting in February. And so one approach would be to have a representative that is focused on uh, the investment and technology side um, at that meeting that would, that's going to happen in February. So I can certainly be a conduit to uh, see if we can get a space at the table. Well, that would be a relatively straightforward thing to do, Ken. I, I think uh, when we think RI, there are several things we need to keep in mind. One is RI for whom? And RI, so who the stakeholder is we're trying to show return on investment on. <laughs> and assumption is it's going to be for, for example, policymakers, et cetera, but just being very clear what the underlying payment model is that's going to influence it. Um, because depending on the payment model, the RI will differ. And the other part is that most healthcare systems have a very, very rudimentary or non-existent uh, cost accounting system. So a big part of return on investment is identifying cost. And most places simply just look at charges and sort of estimate. Um, so I think that's a really important uh, aspect. And uh, I'll just put a plug in. We undertook at our university a really extensive, intensive effort to rebuild our whole costing system. Um, we were just like sequestered in an office for like five months straight, you know, not allowed to leave kind of thing. Um, so uh, I, I, and that, a publication on it is just about to come out in Jamie, it's just in production right now. Um, so uh, just one thing that th I think I learned is most healthcare systems actually have no idea what it costs to provide care. And it, it, so if you're starting with data where it's extremely vague and inaccurate, you could get very wrong ROI results. I, th I think just taking some uh, best practice principles of how you do cost accounting should be taken into account when doing the ROI. Yeah, that's a very, um, <laughs> I, I can't agree more with that. So um, Jamie, maybe I might um, uh, put you on the spot a bit here since I know that um, you know, ONC has certainly been thinking uh, some about this, uh, uh, you know, what your ideas might be in this space about uh, how we might look at a business case or, or ROI. I don't really have specific ideas to share at the moment, but um, I would say that if there's any follow-up discussions, I'd like to be part of it. Um, that's probably all I want to say because I, I haven't been part of some of the CDS discussions at ONC yet, and so I, I don't want to misrepresent what they've already been talking about. Okay, fair enough. When you think about this, we have to keep in mind our previous discussion where we were discussing how do you separate or do you separate the genomics from the genomic CDS and how it seems like that could get really messy in trying to create an ROI, so you have to be really clear on, on what it is. Let me just, I'm sorry, let me just uh, add maybe one more thought out of the box, which may have to do with business cases, uh, I mean that uh, ROI, uh, uh, you know, investment kind of uh, reasoning that's actually specific for genomic type of information. I mean, there's certainly more cost involved in it, right? So the question is, what would the potentially payoff be? So imagine a you know healthcare organization that may maintain good electronic health records and then add genomic layer of information for, you guessed it, research purposes, right? I've been talking about it all the time. But what would be a you know business case for them? It would be engaging you know, pharma companies who could then do uh, either you know clinical trials or a post-market surveillance and so on. And that may be a huge investment, actually, for maintaining electronic health records, signing, you know, f physicians to participate, and then a genomic profiling to generate, you know, research quality data genome-wide. And that data may have a dual purpose, you know, being used for, uh, diag uh, you know, diagnosis, ch uh, choice of therapies, but as well uh, as using as a kind of, you know, a genome-wide surveillance screen in, a, say, a uh, you know, post-market and so on for pharma companies who are interested how their drugs are doing when applied across a large population. I think on this thread, one, one thing I'd just like to point out, you know, there are, of course, the detailed return on investment analyses that are done post hoc, you know, after technology is implemented, what does it do? In addition, though, lots of institutions do ROI estimations and simulations, and CITL did some of that previously. and that can be very helpful just from a modeling sense to get a, a sense of what is, how big is the problem, how big is the opportunity, and, um, I, you know, that doesn't necessarily require 
a whole perspective data gathering, it, but requires an intensive modeling effort. I, I think, I, I guess, um, I've just learned so much about healthcare financing of late, so um, I can share a few perspectives of what people in the healthcare, you know, uh, <clears throat> sort of operational area would be looking for in terms of ROI. So one is, uh, in traditional inpatient payment structures, you are paid a set amount of money depending on the diagnosis-related group and the um, severity-adjusted diagnosis-related groups, the MSDRGs. So in inpatient setting, there's or typical U.S. hospitals, there's already an incentive to reduce costs for a given admission because you're going to be paid the same regardless in most structures. So an obvious ROI in an inpatient setting is do you reduce, can you reduce costs, can you length, uh, shorten length of stay, et cetera. Uh, a similar part is when there are certain conditions where you're not paid for readmissions, reducing readmissions. Uh, another part, a lot of groups are starting to get into managed uh, contracts and bundled payments and um, uh, uh, um, uh, prepayments for certain populations. Um, and there you have all sorts of incentives to manage your patients and prevent them from going into uh, higher cost care, et cetera. So I think there are, if you just talk to the to the you know, folks who are running hospitals, health systems, it's very clear where the incentives are to show ROI. And if you show it in those uh, circumstances, you're very likely to be able to find areas where you find that you know, managing a population of patients with diabetes or hyperlipidemia and you can reduce their overall costs, you will get investment in it. And I think that kind of ROI could be very helpful. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Brian. It's, it's, it's an interest, the concept of ROI for this is interesting because the investment um, is, is, is really in, in the labor of the people in this room and other people will be working with us hopefully for this type of, 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 um, of project and, and that right now is completely unknown um, and, and I think that um, you know, that, that has to be defined at least in some way to, to be able to figure. I mean, what, what we're looking right now is a cost savings. You're describing cost savings, which is only one one side of the equation of return on investment. And I think that the the um, how well this type of clinic, you know, clinical decision support is distributed, and um, you know how you know the, and how interoperable it really is um, will have a huge impact on what the actual investment that the institution has to make in order to get one of these things functional. You know, if, we, if we get something that's minimally interoperable, that requires a huge setup um, and, and huge customization at every institution, then um, you know, no matter how, make, how big the cost savings is, then, then it's not, the equation's not going to help. Amen. I doubt that any implementation done in the context of a research grant is going to show ROI if you actually took into account how much effort went in. But I think the notion is identify cost savings and identify the theoretical potential for the ROI when you can do this efficiently across systems in an operable manner. So there's a couple of things that occur to me from this discussion. One is, is that as we collect use cases, one of the uh, criteria that we could use would be to say, you know, what do we anticipate? you know, would be the uh, impact. If, if things work the way we thought that they worked, what would be uh, the impact of implementation on avoided costs? You know, whether it would be avoided adverse events or something like that. Um, you know, at least get, and not that we have to do formal calculations, but if we can get a, a rough order of magnitude, you could prioritize those use cases that there's consensus around the table that says, you know, if we could really pull this off, this could potentially move the needle as opposed to um, this one, which w is fun, but you know, I mean, you know, we talked, we've been talking about the Abacavir, you know, case, but the reality is, is that, you know, you know it, we're talking about very small numbers of patients that are being, um, you know, impacted by that. So uh, even though it, it's, it's highly important for those individuals, you know, the cost reduction potential for that is probably fairly, uh, fairly minimal. So that would be, uh, you know, one criteria. But the second thing that I heard is that perhaps um, it's just a bit early uh, to be launching into this, that some of the um, uh, work that needs to be done around that um, usability, interoperability, uh, acceptance uh, needs to be understood because to really calculate an ROI, you need to say, well, how much work do I need to do 
uh, on the customization and, and other things before I can really stand this up and see if it, if it works. And if that's the case, then we, this may be something that we would look at, you know, six to 12 months down the road, Ken. And I mean, you can always start with the least costly efforts. I mean, it doesn't take that much effort to say who worked on it and what's their salary and like how much did we spend on software and hardware. And just in a one hour meeting, you get an estimate of, well, if we were doing this using standards, et cetera, what do we think it might have cost? So I, it, I, I think regardless it should be done, the degree of sophistication is diff different, but it, we at least ha should have some guesstimate of what the ROI is. So I think what I'm hearing is that um, for the, um, th this effort in terms of gathering the use cases and, and that, which I think I, Brian and I volunteered for, actually I volunteered and, Brian, and I volunteered Brian to be completely accurate, um, is that one of the criteria that as we uh, build them needs to be, you know, some sort of an assessment of, of uh, impact on cost of care and, uh, and a, uh, an assessment of cost of implementation or something of that nature, and that maybe that's where we start. Does that well, seem Let me just add that, you know, one way is to looking at uh, fixed revenue and just, you know, uh, cutting costs. Another is at looking at additional, you know, source of uh, revenue, say from research organizations such as pharma companies that may actually fund, uh, you know, genome-wide profiling and so on, provided they get some value out of the exercise. So this is where the research uh, aspect comes in. I don't know if you're open to thinking about it. Maybe it's outside of the scope of this, uh, you know, group, but something just throwing out one more time. Mm -hmm. You want to join us? Uh, yeah, I, I can help, uh, you know, whoever takes the lead on this, yeah. Okay, great. So um, that way we won't, won't make sure we're not losing that, that research perspective uh, and the potential value proposition for an organization that could be realizing, you know, uh, developing additional income streams. Just curious, at Geisinger, are you thinking about that? <laughs> How are we thinking about that? Well, actually, we're beyond the thinking stage, and, and I think as most people know here, we, you know, are partnering with Regeneron, and, um, you know, the idea is, is that with the ability to mine uh, clinical uh, data, the hypothesis at least that Regeneron is investing in is the idea that they can uh, rap do more rapid discovery uh, for their um, potential agents in the pipeline based on uh, mining um, clinical phenotypes and then use that uh, to identify those that are most likely to uh, respond and uh, so hopefully cut some of the development costs. Uh, so that's that's their value proposition that they're testing with us. The value proposition for us, of course, is that we are being funded by them to, you know, improve our ability to rapidly phenotype so that we can use those for um, uh, either clinical or research purposes on our side, but also the idea that the sequence data that's being generated uh, by Regeneron comes back to us with no limitations in terms of its clinical application. So we'll have a lot of data uh, that'll, that we'll be able to, um, you know, put into preemptive genotyping data that we could potentially use for clinical purposes. So I imagine the structured, you know, clinical decision support may be important because if you have standardized, you know, practice, uh, uh, m managing of electronic health records and so on, then that helps uh, add the utility to, to this co cohort, right? Yeah, I, I think that, right. you know, from our perspective, the, the developmental costs of this are going to be uh, mar uh, much lower because we have this sort of uh, other income stream that's funding some of the infrastructure that's needed to, uh, to, to make it up, get it up and running. Yeah, so I was, that's the case in point. That's exactly what I was yeah. thinking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Kurt, I think you had a comment that you want to make? You know, most of the, when I look at the return on investment for this, I, I'm kind of struck about how we're talking about doing this. You know, I, I'm one of the naysayers about the utility of pharmacogenomics in general, and that I don't think that's proven particularly effective. We don't have very many examples that it's a huge deal to make a huge amount of infrastructure. And similarly, you know, where genetics has been the most useful right now, you know, based on the CSER project, things like that, is explaining, you know, diseases by genomic sequencing where you end up reporting a few variants. The part of genetics that hasn't been done uh, very much that, that seems like it's in our future given that most of the traits, the complex traits that we're interested in are quite polygenic, is to use another approach. And 
the other approach, you know, there's some skepticism about whether it will work or not, but I think it's, um, I think that's been mis misguided and that I think it's more useful, and that is in predictive genomics. There are some examples that are quite interesting, and, um, you know, people can argue that we're very different than cows, but, you know, a fr substantial fraction of the cows are being genotyped every year in this country. And the reason why is they've been using to figure out how to improve the herd quality. And it's been going on for 15 years. It's changed the improvement of quality of herds from the historical average of half a percent a year to over 2 percent a year. And it's been worth billions and billions of dollars to, to people uh, in that, that business of, you know, getting better cows, choosing the best bull for the next year. Um, you know, in the United States, we, you know, we think about healthcare and what we could do with this, but, you know, in predictive genomics, there is the potential to identify, you know, is drug A better than drug B for, per, you know, for person X? And I think that's actually something that we don't put in our model right now because, you know, the best return on investment we have is reporting in the medical record through rather simple means, you know, this person has a BRCA1 mutation. And I think, you know, thinking forward in the future where return on investment is, it's going to be in a model that requires good access to phenotype data, ability to share across large populations informations from, uh, of, you know, good quality genomic data. I don't actually think we need, you know, whole genome sequencing to do that. You could do it with a good GWAS chip. Uh, and, you know, that can be done relatively inexpensively in this era. Uh, I think it's implicit, but just want to <clears throat> make explicit that, um, I mean, we're talking about cost and revenue, et cetera, but it's been shown that improving quality of care and outcomes generally results in better financial bottom line. So I, I, I don't want, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page that, I mean, ultimately we're about improving patients. It's just also showing the downstream financial benefits of it as well. I mean, obviously if all we were doing this was for you know, reducing costs and improving um, uh, revenue, then we're probably in the wrong line of business. But I think that's, you know, that's a really good point, and, and uh, shame on me for uh, forgetting that. But uh, this now also, I think, would be implicit in the end-to-end -end project that we're talking about, because as we look at the patient outcome, uh, then that does, in fact, have an implication related to cost of care and potentially could track back to return on investment. So. I think what we're doing is we're kind of taking this and saying, you know, we can put this into a couple of other places that we're interested in um, uh, in exploring and not necessarily have it as a standalone. Maybe and just pragmatically, you'll need to show the financial ROI to convince uh, an operation to invest the system resources to building these kind of capabilities, but in order to convince clinicians to actually follow these guidelines and to use them, they will not care about the costs. They, they will want to make sure that it's improving care. So you, you need both for a very pragmatic reason because you need to convince two stakeholders. Right. As Brent James at Intermountain says, you know, cost and outcomes are two sides of the same coin, but which side of the coin we pay attention to depends on, you know, your perspective. Unfortunately, that's the reality. Okay, any other discussion about the ROI business case? Okay. Um, so there wasn't, um, I think what I would propose is, um, you know, to not take off the list, but to perhaps, you know, put as uh, potential considerations for the future uh, the role of the public versus the public's health and uh, the uh, role of the patient caregiver um, for genomic uh, clinical decision support. Although um, perhaps with the latter one, um, if there's no objection, we could add that to the range of use cases uh, that could potentially be explored, um, and that would be a relatively, um, prob probably a fairly straightforward thing to uh, uh, to create and just kind of test that out. So um, if no one you know, thinks that's a bad idea, we could just add that to the, to the list, and so we're at least doing something in that space. Really, none of, none of our projects work in that area. Is there, is there a group that we could link? Well, it just, it just so happens, Terry, that, that so I, I'm through, very Picornet? close to a group that is looking at it precisely this uh, example. So this would be the PCORNET? 
No, this would be me, us, Geisinger. Oh, um, within since within your we're, we're, Since Kessinger. we're internally funding a study looking at developing genomic, patient-facing genomic test reports. So, so I could put my name rather than we next to the, uh, the, the use case there. Yeah, and in a sandbox, we can even have a, a uh, personal health record that we could, uh, you know, test as well. So I think that fits into that sandbox. If we have some use cases that we want to uh, prototype and, and do that in that sandbox, I think it's doable. Yeah, and the interesting thing as part of our research is we're actually um, doing um, uh, ongoing engagement with uh, our families uh, of these children would have, which have complex disorders. Um, with semi-structured interviews and focus groups to hear back about how they want to get that information back. And we're learning some very interesting things about that. I mean, we tend, again, focus on things like, well, patient portals and this sort of thing. But in, in the wilds of central Pennsylvania, uh, issues of connectivity and that sort of thing are, are problematic. And so people are saying, well, could you just give us a flash drive? that has this on there that we, that we could, you know, we have the links and everything, but then we don't have to, you know, spend hours trying to connect up through the patient portal to actually uh, get at something. So I mean, those are the sorts of things, the, the usability uh, user input that we're talking about from the physician standpoint that are also be important from the, potentially from the patient family caregiver standpoint. So Brandon just referred to the sandbox as something that was, you know, up and running and available, but obviously we don't have one. So do we need to talk about where that would be or who would host it or when it's, when is an appropriate time to bring it up? Because it seems as though it would be related to a number of the things we're talking about. So the key folks to uh, just really get this discussion going with is Steve Brown, because he's the sponsor for, for this. He, or to, to start, and I mean, the idea would be sandboxes usually are created using virtual images, right? Uh, virtual server images, et cetera, and then if anybody else wants to host it somewhere else, you just host the, just pay for an Amazon cloud service and just host it elsewhere. But generally we create sandboxes so that it's easy to transport between servers. Yeah, I just want to be sure we had it somewhere. Yeah. It's in the cloud, that's the answer to everything now, right? So. It's at the Vanderbilt cloud. Okay, um, so I want to come back to you, Terry, and, and uh, because one of the objectives of this was to look at uh, the potential for um, developing information that, that might be of interest to NHGRI in terms of developing, you know, uh, funding proposals going forward. Not that the be-all and end-all of this was to say, okay, well, NHGRI is going to commit to funding this much of, in, in this space, but are there have you heard what you need to hear um, to take back to um, uh, your colleagues uh, and say, well, within this space, here are some things that are of potential interest that we, you know, might want to explore further, facilitate, uh, et cetera? Yeah, well, yes and no. So, um, so yes in terms of lots of, of cool ideas in, in lots of areas. I, I think the challenge we have is that we're a small institute we have a, a pretty specific mandate, and it's not entirely clear to me how we can, you know, bring forward this mission on our own. Now, obviously, we don't have to do it on our own. We have other institute partners in the in the room, but um, but I think what what we would need to do would be, you know, this isn't something Genome can do by itself. Uh, that's that's become pretty clear to me, and and it's. Wonderful that Jim and Jim and, and others um, from from NLM are here because they do seem to um, work in this in this space in terms of, of medical records and standards and, and that sort of thing. Um, to the degree that we can bring along other institutes, that too would be great. It, it's not. I, I haven't heard um, necessarily. A, you know, a, a couple of use cases, and they may come up and, and that that would identify. You know, an obvious other. Institute partner, and if anybody has those in mind, that would be great to hear. Um, or if those of you who are working in the clinical decision support realm know of, of institutes that are supporting work in this area, and, and we can we have databases, we can search for that, and we can obviously talk to our colleagues. But but if you know that oh, Institute X is like really committed to this area, that would be helpful to know as well. So, so the charge to the group then that we could you know put out in in, in our summary would be to. You know, if, you, if there are, are potentially willing partners around a specific uh, area uh, that could work together with uh, Genome to at least propose those so that we, there could be some exploration. 
Right, and, and I guess I, you know, I, I, maybe I could have phrased that better. Uh, we, we at NIH should know what each other at NIH are doing, just like other parts of the government should know what they're doing. Um, but if, if you're aware of, of particular areas that maybe not, are not even on the radar screen of a, of a given institute, but should be, you know, so that so disease X is something that's, you know, really hot in terms of decision support, it's, it presents all, you know, the huge spectrum of problems that genomics does, and, and here's a real opportunity, you should go talk with them, that would be helpful to know. And so let me just ask, are, are there areas in decision support that you all are aware of that, that are like this? Uh, well, well, so that's, that's the current decision support portfolio question. Uh, I think my, I, ex yeah. I extend it slightly to um, receptive institutes that oh, sure. ha have the problem but may not know they have it. <laughs> well, no, and exactly. and I, so I think there, um, the, the new leadership of CBIT for the National Cancer Informatics Program would be a natural group of folks to host the conversation, and, and I'd be happy to, since we're their advisory committee, to kind of uh, nudge their, an elbow in the ribs to uh, at least start that conversation to see if there is common ground. And Warren and David Patton and Tony Collard are interested in that. I, I'm, I've spoken to them in depth about that, so that, that is possibly one area. So it sounds like we have at least one potential idea. Let, let me um, come back and again, I think you can kind of tell given, you know, the, uh, pers that this is a personal interest of mine in terms of the role of the patient caregiver in this process. Um, and I know that uh, you've had some uh, uh, outreach to PCORI and to Joe, and that Joe was actually at one of our um, previous meetings. Um, Given that there have been other ICs that have actually partnered, or at least a couple of them that have partnered with PCORI to develop an RFA, is this something that you see as, as being of any interest uh, to Genome? Is this something that, uh, that we could potentially move forward on and, and at least explore possibilities? Genome is always interested in partnering with, <laughs> with other groups. I mean, you know, we can't do our work without doing that, basically. Um, so, so absolutely, we would, we would be interested. I, I think, you know, the, the question is how, how much our work fits into what PCORI is, is <laughs> mandated to do. And, and while I think they see that their patient-centered focus, you know, it could relate because patients are, you know, think genomics is really cool and, and really want to learn more about it, you know, to, to what degree they can actually commit in this area has not been clear to me at all. So. Yeah, and, it, and it's all, you know, their, their bandwidth is pretty much, at this point, I, if I'm accurate, observer of it fully consumed with just trying to get the core net up to do even very, very simple demonstrations that they can connect with patients and get data back. And so I, I think it would be pretty much out of their available bandwidth for uh, at least a while. For PCORNET, probably so, but of course that's only uh, one uh, por portion of their portfolio. They have ongoing, you know, funding in a number of different areas, and particularly things like communication dissemination would be an area. But they've also then funded, uh, you know, the NIA project on falls prevention is sort of was outside of any of their standard uh, um, um, uh, fund, funding cycles. It was not par, uh, tied into PCORNET, um, you know, and so I think they do have some additional capacity to get, you know, funds out the door if, you know, the, 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 if they have a, a, a good partner, a compelling project, and it, and it fits within their orientation of comparative effectiveness and patient-centeredness. And in some ways, I mean, the, the, the argument that you can make is, you know, what's more patient-centered than, you know, than, than the genome? I mean, using a genetic-centric cent uh, focus of the world. Uh, now, obviously, you know, uh, th that's a, uh, you know, a faith-based uh, and, and evangelical um, uh, argument, but the idea of, um, you know, treating uh, people uh, from the perspective of not only their individual uh, beliefs, but also individual level data as opposed to applying population level data, you know, should at least in theory be of some attraction. Well, sure, but, you know, there's theory and then there's other things. And, and I, I think, you know, if, if we can come up with a, with a compelling, you know, project, as you said, something that is, is patient-centered and is focused on genomics. I, you know, I haven't, that hasn't bubbled to the top as we've been talking, but there may be some, and we, you know, perhaps identifying a couple of those to take to PCORI would be a useful thing. 
So maybe that's something that we could take back. I think this has actually been on the agenda for the GMWG steering committee in terms of some of the discussions we've had. I, I seem to recall my name at some point in the past being attached to PCORI. Uh, yes. Um, so maybe that's something we could just, you know, resurrect uh, in that uh, forum and see if we might be able to, within our group, uh, develop a couple of ideas that might, you know, potentially resonate and then see if we can establish connections um, uh, with uh, with some of the PCORI folks uh, uh, related to, uh, to to how that would uh, how that would work. Ken. At set of NIH, I mean, track record wise, AHRQ has funded CDS consortium and GEM and you know, very very related work. So maybe just talking with John White might be useful. And, and what's your sense of um, where where they're at currently uh, related to that, either Ken or Blackford? Blackford. Yeah. I mean, they had a very significant portfolio uh, starting approximately six or seven years ago. I think it was 40 million or so. And uh, there is interest in actually re, 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 uh, restocking, if you will, the funding for sort of next generation HIT research, but I don't know how, the, how big it is yet. All right. Um, I think we've pretty well gone through the uh, through the list. Um, any other ideas, um, comments, questions, um, contributions at this point from the from the group as a whole? Jamie. Yeah, I know I missed this morning, and I apologize. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure if I've followed enough to s understand if you did talk about this already, but I was really attracted to the idea that Dan brought up yesterday about the whole library. And I don't know if that's something that could be covered in any of the work that you've outlined here or if it's an additional topic. Well, we actually, uh, um, uh, Dan didn't, did bring that up, and as we discussed that, and I think it may have been before you, you came in this morning, uh, one of the questions was, you know, where would that reside? Who would have ownership of that? And so in some sense, uh, if that's something you're particularly interested in and would be willing to explore with the group about, you know, how, what that might look like and whether or not that would be something that ONC could, you know, have at least some ownership with or partner with someone to, to, to own, I think that would be uh, highly valuable. We discussed that in the context of developing the range of use cases thinking from the perspective that as we begin to work out some of the details of how to make these things work, that we would ultimately then like to have a repository where uh, they could be placed as they become um, more mature and, and implementable. So um, we'd love to have your engagement um, on that particular uh, process. Happy to be engaged. I don't think, I don't know if ONC is the right owner, but we definitely, you know, our role as coordinator, we'd love to help start the conversation. So Dan, would you be willing to maybe, um, um, with Jamie, kind of uh, take the lead on, on maybe beginning those types of explorations? Yeah, I, I think the, the architecture of how you um, try to make progress, um, socio-technical progress on more than one level uh, is uh, an interesting question, you know, how to uh, partition and then um, get natural sponsors and owners for the public good that results. Uh, it's, it's sure an interesting topic to, to talk about. As, uh, it's, um, as again, that's sort of more social than technical, but it's got a clear embedded technical layer. Terry? So, so I would think that would be something that NHGRI could actually participate in and, and would have, have a little bit of bandwidth. Ken Wiley would be the, the logical person. Okay, so and Ken the, And we've actually, we were talking at the break with, with Betsy and, and Jim Semino about the possibility, so I don't, I don't want to volunteer you guys, but we can certainly keep you in the loop um, if you <laughs> What do you say, Jim? <laughs> Jim's in, all right, so it sounds yeah. like we've got to... So, and, and of course, he would, he, anything. he would be volunteering on behalf of NCBI and Jim Ostell sitting here being, being quiet. I think, I think we should also invite HRQ to that conversation. Yes, yes, we, we, should, we should do that. <laughs> A little late. 
And, you know, well, they, the uh, AHRQ, of course, did fund the CDS Consortium, which created the, uh, a prototype library, so I'd love to be uh, helpful. We also uh, um, will have someone from AHRQ coming to ONC to fill some of our acting positions as a detail, so that'll be a great time to start that conversation. Okay, so it sounds like we've got a pretty good um, uh, nidus of folks to move that forward, so that's great. We can attach some names to that as well, and then that'll just be a matter of coordinating. So it's uh, Dan, Ken Wiley, uh, Jamie, uh, Jim Simino, and then uh, an ARC uh, victim to be named later, uh, so. Give, give, give Jim Ostell as well. Yeah. What do you think, Jim? It's such a, such a kind, flattering, uh, flattery will get you everywhere. Okay, great. So good, we have a lot of names attached to that particular item now. Um, so, and that we'll just, then we'll just, that'll be something that uh, the use case collection group and the sandbox, so we'll just kind of think about that as, uh, you know, as, a, as a, a throughput so we keep all those pieces hopefully talking to one another, so. Great, any, any other comments, questions, concerns, Ken? It's a general notion, I, there's a lot of people who are engaged here and obviously people who can volunteer for different groups is, um, is a more limited set. If there's a way to just keep other folks informed, even if it's just, if there's an email thread or an update that can be sent out, just something to consider, um, like a typical HL7 or SDO approach is that acknowledging a lot of people can only just, you know, read the minutes to see what's going on, but might want to pipe up. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll try and, and do that in as, much as, uh, in as much as we can. I know we certainly have the distribution list uh, available to us. Uh, one of the challenges sometimes is actually, uh, um, you know, having the, the ownership of the groups to actually create that sort of an, an output, although one would hope that that would be part of the, the work. But I think in as much as we can uh, do create that, we would have a distribution uh, pipeline that we could utilize. Okay, before we officially end, I want to have uh, Rita and Teji uh, come up here to get um, uh, an official uh, thank you and round of applause for their outstanding work related to the logistics. Yeah, and, and in particular, um, uh, I, should, I didn't mention this before, but Teji uh, actually uh, created the survey and did a lot of the analytics and that sort of thing. So that was a tremendous amount of work um, and kind of a last minute harebrained idea that we came up with. And so she turned it around very quickly. So thanks very much for that. And then I also want to thank our um, uh, representatives from NHGRI, so uh, Jackie and Annie, and who have also been taking notes. And, and uh, for all of those that I've forgotten to mention, um, uh, uh, you are in my thoughts, even if you're not in my, <laughs> not in my mouth. Um, and uh, most, I'm sorry? Maggie. Maggie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and Albert. Oh, yes, yes, our webcast. Will say, yeah. Right, thank you so much for doing that because obviously we had a lot of people engaged at distance and, and I, I was telling Maggie earlier that this has been a really well-behaved group because <laughs> I've never been at a meeting that Maggie's been at before where we didn't have her yelling, use the microphone. So you guys did a great <laughs> job, so, so take a attaboy out of petty cash for that one. Um, but mostly thanks to all of you for taking time out of your, um, your busy lives to participate, to take the time to fill out the survey, to actively engage in discussion, to volunteer for uh, more work uh, to be done, uh, and for the uh, uh, efforts that we will be um, uh, asking you for in the future. And Brandon wants the last word. Well, I'm just, are these slides going to be available? Right, so um, I don't know exactly how we're going to um, to stand, but this will all be publicly available. I don't know if we'll create a web page yeah, for so, this. Or? So the, if, you, if you Google NHGRI genomic medicine activities, um, one of the first thing that comes up is our, our web page of meetings, and each meeting has a, a, you know, a, a highlight that links you to the agenda, the videos when they're available, and these guys are, are very fast at, at doing that, um, and, the, um, and the slides, the actual PowerPoint slides. So, so those will all be available relatively soon, but not, not tomorrow. 
Thank you to my co-moderator, who may want to also. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. I just want to say uh, thanks to the group as well. Really great to see these two communities come together, and it's been a pleasure working with you and meeting a lot of new folks. Great. Safe travels, everyone.